Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, a wonderful Thursday. Uh, it might be morning for you. It might be afternoon for you. It might be evening for you. Uh, we have so many uh, great people that have joined in on these webinars, and we really, really thank you. My name is Michael Cioni. I'm the Senior Vice President of Frame.io's Innovation Department, and uh, we are here joined with some really stellar, stacked, I've been writing on my social media, this is a stacked group. <laughs> because some of the best opportunities when you're discussing anything is being able to discuss it with people that have a lot of perspective and a lot of vast knowledge and experience and connections and uh, connection points. And uh, this is just an amazing group of people that we have today. So I'm really excited to dive in to some talks about workflow and we're also going to cover aspects of pre-COVID versus post-COVID strategies, pressure points, uh, and concerns and where we've seen successes and challenges and then ultimately what we can all do to prepare uh, for the new normal because you know do we want to go back to normal I don't know normal wasn't really that great if you ask me so maybe we don't want to go back to normal we want to keep some of the experiences that we're learning here and take them forward in order to do that we want to strongly encourage you to write questions we actually have help uh, on the frame IO team that will be taking your questions and they'll be feeding them to us and our panelists. So we would like to actually stop halfway through or, or, or partial way through. So if you have specific questions for people or topics that we're touching on, please write them down. They'll get to us and we'll try to call those out throughout as opposed to having a Q&A at the end. So that'll be our format. That's enough of me yakking. So why don't I uh, introduce our wonderful panelists who are participating today. Let's start with Paul. Paul, welcome. Sure, sure. How are you doing, everybody? Um, this is Paul Nicholson from Showtime Networks. I am the Senior Vice President of Production and Technology there. And uh, really what that means ultimately is that we have an in-house creative agency that I handle all aspects of production for, and uh, whether it be pre and post production or print production, etc. And all of the technology we use from a creative standpoint. Welcome. Uh, hi, I'm Laurel Dusenberry, and I am a VP and Creative Director in our at CBS in our in-house marketing department. Um, and my focus is mostly on the creative side and editorial, but I've also been heavily involved in Frame.io and a lot of our technology in the department. Hi, Reed Kaufman, uh, VP of Media Workflows for Fox Sports, overseeing post-production for our uh, studio shows as well as our remote events uh, like the Super Bowl and the World Cup. And uh, we've been Frame.io customer for four or five years and, and uh, continue to expand what we're doing with them. So excited to talk about it today. Awesome, thank you all for being here. And again, so we've got, we've got Paul from Showtime, we've got Laurel from CBS, and we've got Reed from uh, Fox Sports. And so we've got a really wide gamut. So the first thing I wanna talk about Obviously, we've been hearing about the technology challenges. Um, I wouldn't say we've exhausted all the topics there. I still want to touch some of that. But what I want to start with is the human challenges. What have been the actual biggest challenges and the biggest eye openers that have to do with the human side of what we're going through instead of the technical side, which often is the headline? Paul, can you, can you start us off on that? Sure, sure. Um... Probably the biggest challenge I've found is actually finding time to shave. Um, that's been the first sort of big uh, human hurdle. Um, this isn't a thing. This never happens for me. So, uh, you know, this is new for COVID. That's good. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, seriously, there they, they was, I, I'm sure everybody was in the same boat. We had about 24 hours notice before we had to basically take an entire uh, network mobile and remote and so it was a uh, mad dash of getting people to be comfortable with some of these new technologies such as frame.io or maybe it's slack or other things that people weren't necessarily onboarded with um, and so there was a lot of hand holding a lot of comforting of the uh, from the human side you know just from a technology leadership position um, and then it's just you know everybody has a lot of challenges uh, you know there are kids that are home that need to be schooled We've got to allow for a time for people to, you know, be able to attend to their families and the needs of like running to the grocery store at, at the right moment. And just like uh, uh, allowing the day to sort of expand in a way that everybody can accommodate their personal needs as well as address all of the business needs. Yeah, I mean, I, I think pretty much, I agree with pretty much everything Paul has said. I, you know, for me personally, it's balancing um, having a kid at home, who are homeschooling, who's also special needs, and so kind of balancing all of that. But I think uh, to the point of our 
department, I think recognizing that not everybody is universally as tech savvy. So throwing editors who are using equipment every day, um, but necessarily throwing that in, throwing it out there as to where they have to work from home and kind of triaging tech support for them um, has definitely been difficult, I know, in our on our tech teams. But I think just having patience and allowances for the fact that everybody's lives have changed pretty quickly um, has been a big part of what we've discussed. Yeah, uh, a lot of the same over here. It was a, an interesting dichotomy where you know, some of the teams I work closely with because we do, um, you know, events and shows, you know, on remote and on, on the road sometimes at, at small venues where some of us were pretty capable and then others you know, at Fox weren't, they never have to leave and they didn't even have a laptop in some cases. So, um, you know, as Paul said, it was a, a pretty quick scramble on our side too, um, to figure out, you know, what gaps do you need to fill in the near term to get people working remotely and what things can get moving. But, um, you know, definitely a, a big uh, scale up as far as um, support, I think as Laurel said too, for um, how do you support now a, you know, geographically dispersed operation. And, and I think people will be probably trying to figure that out for, for quite a while. <laughs> and it, we certainly are. Um, it's a yeah, great point. It's, interesting. It, it's a great point. And, and I, I want to follow up with that for a moment because um, what you, you know, Laurel, you mentioned triaging and we're all talking about the personal versus the professional balance, which of course we always had to deal with. It's just, it's, it's in a completely new like package. You know, we've, we've all had to kind of balance those two things. We just never had to balance them in this form. Um, but what, what, what's interesting about this particular panel is you are all part of companies that have thousands and thousands of colleagues. And the amount of content that your networks are putting out still per day is still massive. So one of the things that I noticed that we're all getting better at is troubleshooting because we don't have that person we could just yank into the room. And so all of us have to like, even getting on this call requires more troubleshooting than we're used to having to do. So Paul, how have, how have, how have people in your camp actually dealt with the troubleshooting, especially since you said not everyone is aware of Slack. Is everyone now on it? Is everybody, was there Slack training? What can companies that have large groups of people do to help manage some of those troubleshooting needs? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's certainly a challenge. Again, given, you know, about 24 hours notice, and as Reed said, some people didn't even have laptops or computers and were sort of issuing them computers. They've never, they've never turned off, you know, dealt with a laptop even. And uh, some people, uh, you know, there's such a range of people, right? Some people can work directly off a laptop and a 13 inch screen is all they need to do their part of the job. Maybe they're a project manager or something like that. And then you've got full on editors who need like three monitors and, QC equipment and the proper headphones and things like that, that they didn't have at home. And so we're, we're still even dealing with a mixed bag of equipment that people have in their home to do their job. And slowly we're rolling out equipment or we're buying stuff and having it shipped there and, and things like that. But now you're putting people in a position where they're literally plugging wires in together to make stuff work and they're not used to doing that job, right? So, you know, we, we did onboard everybody really quickly to the tools like Slack, uh, some, some on Asana, some on Frame.io that weren't on there. And we've provided channels, uh, more specifically in Slack, for all the different kind of help categories. And, and I've got a team of people that I sort of assigned to just watching those channels. So there's like a Slack help channel. There's like a Frame.io help channel. There's a working remotely channel for the sort of general issues of working remotely, like tips and tricks on how to like make your own standing desk and things like that, that ah, hoping that people fun. get through. Um, so, you know, just the, mostly it's, it's uh, focusing the tech support people that used to be running around physically installing servers and things and repurposing them to address everyone's little sort of nuanced need in any one of these applications. Yeah, I mean, so our department, there was, you know, Slack was something we've used pretty heavily in the past, um, but not everybody was was really involved or ready to jump on board. And I think that once people realized how many how many emails you're getting suddenly working remote and and just the sheer amount of or how communication has changed and it was, you know, coming fast and furious, I think um, we've moved a lot to Slack and similarly we have channels for different support. Um, you know, our iLink team has a channel for the people working Avid in the cloud remotely. 
Um, so I think we're definitely using those tools heavily as well as frame. But I think, you know, one thing I've noticed is that there, there are a lot of people who, especially editors, who are maybe more tech savvy than others, who are really reaching out and helping others and kind of building a sense of community, whether it be on FaceTime or Zoom, um, like taking, you know, remote desktop. So I've really, I've loved seeing our department kind of help each other, which is a big thing. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's surfacing um, new new challenges, obviously, right? And and um, I, I, that's a great point, Laurel, and seeing how certain people can kind of come together and, and work in 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 the spirit of you know getting things going that we haven't done before. You can get a sense for who thrives in that and who's who's kind of struggling <laughs> with uh, with these new challenges, right? And and you know, part of that's exciting, I think, with pushing the envelope on what we can do with technology to either, you know, work just as well as we had before, or, or maybe even figure out new ways of doing things. And I think that's going to be, and not to step on your toes here, Michael, probably on a future question, but it's going to be exciting, I think, to see, you know, what do we learn from this to, to figure out what we can leverage in the future, even when we don't have these restrictions from staying at home. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, I do want, let's go into that. Um, first, there was a comment that was made about Paul's background. Paul, you got to tell us what you're, what's going on with your background. It's, a, it's gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I'm, I'm social distancing. That isn't a live crew behind me. That is a Zoom background. Uh-huh. It's I like to just, you know, hey, keep it down back there. That's right. <laughs> good. It's, it's, it's very, very well composited. So, Lisa actually asks us about NAS storage, and she, she obviously comes from a facility background. And her comment and question is they've been using Frame.io for the last four years in the approval process, and that's been working for them. But the question is about the lift for mm -hmm. individuals in terms of the data storage and the actual original assets and how that's getting to other people. How does everyone at your networks access the large media files remotely? Um, are you guys bringing that media to the people's homes, or are they tunneling in, what, what are uh, some of the techniques that you're, you're actually technically deploying? Um, uh, yeah, uh, that's the biggest challenge, right? Like the, the big media files are clearly the thing that we're uh, all probably battling the most because it's just the sheer amount of time that it takes to move this stuff around uh, is a real issue. And, and again, 24 hours notice, not, every, not everything was in sort of cloud environments where it was easily accessible. And so everything requires at least a copy up and a copy down from some system or service or, or platform such as Frame. So, you know, we use uh, Spara uh, uh, to a large extent even before this where we were sort of acquiring content through Spara and distributing content through, through Spara portals. And so we're using that and we sort of quickly scrambled to get people user accounts there so that they could have their uh, place to put stuff and, and, and copy from. Uh, Frame.io has been a big help actually, just having that being you know in, on the AWS and, and the cloud um, has helped tremendously with sort of parking files there for people to get access to, to download and, and or upload, even in the longer form in some cases. Um, a number of scenarios. We, we're also a reach engine uh, shop for our MAM is reach engine. And so we're, we're, we were in the middle of a POC that we happened to sort of S accelerate greatly in this, in this current situation so that we could start parking stuff up there for at least for people to be screening some of the long form material. Um, and, you know, and then stuff gets copied down and then it has to get copied back up and put in the right place so that it's archived and that it's protected and not sitting in someone's living room. Um, so this, there's clearly that's the biggest challenge. Uh, no, no question. We are not, somebody asked a question about sneaker netting drives around. We're not doing any of that. People really are reluctant to get any kind of deliveries in their house. And so we, we really have avoided shipping anything out in, except in the most extreme scenarios. Um, but, uh, yeah, a lot of time is being spent copying these files for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, for us, we're much in the, the same scenario. Aspera is something that uh, our operations team has been using for a long time. Um, so that's been a continued uh, service for us. I think, you know, really taking into account the sheer amount of time it takes to download stuff. Everybody's uh, connection speeds are different, and that's, you know, a hurdle. Um, and then also upload speed just being much, much slower and people not necessarily realizing um, how long it takes to upload things. Um, Frame.io was already a, a 
a space where rough cuts of episodes and that those sorts of things were available for viewing. Um, so that workflow has continued and been very helpful um, for creative directors like myself to be able to give notes and get that um, off to editors. And we have, you know, in a couple, like Paul had mentioned, ex you know, emergency or extreme situations, we've we've had to send a drive. But for the most part, um, we're using Aspera, and then we do have Avid in the cloud that our operations team really got up and running really well, so we're able to access um, the nexus on the ground for us. Yeah, we're um, as much as possible trying to kind of tunnel into to systems um, that are installed kind of directly on, on the lot. Uh, you know, a couple groups went off quickly and started trying to compile a bunch of footage and export it out and then upload it and download it. And eventually we kind of had to just pump the brakes on that because it, it, you know, that does take a lot of, you know, people power as well. And those people weren't there anymore. So it wasn't a sustainable model for us right now to just copy all this footage that everybody needed to access and whatever that was, whether you put it on a drive or uploading it to, we, we use Aspera and obviously Framo as well, whatever it is, you know, just the whole overhead of that was really not sustainable with the restrictions for, um, you know, safety. Uh, so yeah, so we've been kind of laser focused on um, ex scaling up and, and, um, and tweaking and enhancing the performance of uh, people accessing our systems remotely and, and basically taking control of a, of a machine that's installed to, to then, you know, access everything that they already have from plugins to footage to, you know, um, other applications and, and delivery workflows um, so that they can do that from home. So we're just focused on uh, improving that user experience and, and performance uh, remotely. Reed, across all those plugins and all those editors, how have you managed plugins and versions? This was actually a question uh, from, uh, it was Oliver, that was asking about versions and plugins, and you just mentioned that specifically. Have you come up with a way to make sure that there's consistency throughout the fleet? No, uh, okay. it's terrible. It's one of the things I hate. That and fonts, I think, are, are the bane of my existence. Um, yeah, the worst. Um, no, and so that's kind of partially why we are, you know, trying to stop down on, look, instead of disparate sort of uh, systems and, and, you know, that's really only an issue if you need to do some projects exchange and, and whatnot. So we, you know, we don't uh, concern ourselves too much if we have sort of a fully self-contained edit, you know, a lot of what we do is short form. So if we have a fully self-contained and we're just getting a, a fully rendered piece back from it, but um, where, we're, where we do have sort of that more collaborative workflow, um, that's why we're putting a lot of our focus on using our existing systems and just extending access to those uh, remotely. Yeah, it's, okay, it's if really, I, go for it, yeah. Sorry, sorry, just to jump in, I, it just struck, sort of uh, reminded me of something that I didn't mention, which is, you know, there, there are a lot of, uh, you know, it's a lot of VPNing into systems that are more powerful than what you've got at home in the office. And so you can VPN and you can do some work there, even copy to and from those internal servers, um, which is great. Um, but, you know, not ideal for a lot of the kinds of work that you need to do. Um, it, was, it was really funny, actually, because the first week that people were remote, I still, myself and some of us were in as sort of a skeleton crew, making sure that everything was set to go. And you would just see all the monitors moving because people were like remotely controlling all of these Macs in one room. And it's like a bunch of ghosts sitting at the edit stations, you know. Um, and, and, that's, and that's cool and all, but like, you know, so that was like the first step of getting people to be able to continue to do some of their work. But then as soon as people got settled, the focus, I'm sure for all of us and, and probably many on the call, the focus becomes how do we improve the situation now going forward? And so you start immediately looking at things like I mentioned, the POC with Reach Engine, and looking for other ways we can use Frame that we weren't necessarily even planning on using it. Um, editing in the cloud and how can we light up some workstations there that we haven't necessarily fully tested, but um, maybe it's good enough for certain people that are doing kind of low level, low tier editing that, you know, they, they can get away with it. Um, we, we lit up some uh, Amazon workspaces computers that are sort of an alternative to VPNing into your network, but actually positioning a, a pretty high powered PC on your network. So there's lots of things that you do, but like you, we, we all had to shift our focus to how do you, how do you improve the situation? Because we're going to be here for a while. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good point. And I actually want to, let, let's dive into that for a second. I know none of us are doctors and sociologists and mathematicians. We, we, so 
disclaimer to everyone watching, we're not making government level predictions here. But what I would like to do is ask you, based on what you're experiencing, could you assign, this is very rough, I expect, but could you assign a percentage of the level of efficiency that you've either maybe increased in some areas and decreased in others? Because I think at the beginning, all of us assumed there'd be just a net loss across the board. But I'm not so sure that's what everyone's feeling now that we're starting to get used to some of this stuff. I, I once said, um, some people think that we're, this is going to be treated like a camping trip. Like we're just gonna, you know, take what we need to go on a camping trip. But you just said, Paul, this could be a while. And I think in some aspects, it's permanent. This is a foundation for a net new future. It is not a camping trip. And if you've only packed enough for camping, you're dead. So <laughs> could, you, could you guys kind of share some of those ideas? So we'll start with you again, Paul. Percentage of what you think is working more efficiently versus less efficiently and what you'll keep versus what you'll uh, leave back in the COVID space? Yeah, yeah. It, it diff it's different for different areas. I mean, for me anyway, you know, there are certain people that are less efficient. Uh, you know, we have a, a team of editors that we call post-production services at Showtime. They are the digital Swiss army knife of video. They, they version everything, they QC everything, right? They, they're the ones that are actually delivering the end files. They're, they, you know, they're handcuffed right now because they're always copying and copying and copying and unable to really act with speed. Um, so although they're getting everything done amazingly, their days are much longer, it's a much slower process and, and, and those sorts of things. But there's a ton of other areas where I think we've seen great, greater efficiency that we've exposed problems in our workflow when we were in the office that we've now fixed just by the nature of the fact that we either maybe we can't do that anymore and now we realize we never needed to do that. Or there was a lot of wasted time with, you know, office banter and, uh, you know, uh, water cooler talk and that kind of thing, or, um, you know, just, uh, just the lack of efficiency that the office brought to it versus uh, having to think of shortcuts or more efficient ways of working. None bigger than Slack, by the way. I mean, I think for us, we were so heavy on email and Slack has the, 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 the whole nature of Slack being such a messaging platform that it like it is just sped up communication tremendously. And whereas we had probably, you know, a 25% of the staff on Slack before, and they were already seeing some of that. We've now, you know, we increased hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people onto the platform. And so that's, that's helped us greatly. But I think, you, you know, all of us have exposed problems in our workflow that we've now fixed because of the lack of an office. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of what um, you said, Paul, is pretty true for us as well. Um, I, I think a big, a big thing that I feel we've improved by being remote is our ability to communicate and our uh, much to your point about Slack. I think um, the way we're communicating is more efficient for less email or just a quick Zoom or things that maybe would have been a longer process. I also think we're pushing people into using more shared documents and all of these things that are better now that we just can't run into somebody's office or a quick question. Um, but I think, you know, speaking for a lot of the editors, I feel that that there is an increase in how much people are getting done based on the kind of the their general mood with being at home. And I think being in their own space and that's sometimes a, a better place to be creative and your family is with you. Um, and your dog, if you hear my dog barking. Um, it, so I think, you know, that not commuting, there are a lot of things that I think just lead to better creative. Um, and our, you know, production team and online, there have been some hurdles being in the cloud and color correction and all of that. But I feel like we're really operating near full capacity like we were before. It's not perfect. Um, but I, I see that there is a lot of opportunities for maybe people you know, who could be remote after this. Yeah, uh, great points. Um, same on our side too, I think. Um, additionally, we're finding that uh, where we can use technology better to do, you know, some of the same things that we are used to doing, you know, with, with, with physical, you know, resources in front of us as opposed to VPNing or in or using the cloud. Um, we're starting to talk about how you know, this can help us either scale or sort of reduce physical footprint for our 
infrastructure in the future. Um, and, and as you know, what it's really forcing is everyone to kind of gain a competency for, for this technology <laughs> where there was either reluctance or just not enough time because, you know, we got to get stuff on the air, right? And you have to focus on what you need to do today and not enough time to, you know, put some really, really talented minds to work on, all right, well, let's, let's look towards the future a little more. And, and we didn't often have that luxury. Um, and now it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. <laughs> but sometimes that's how you, you accelerate these things. So, um, so I think that's exciting to where we can start to say, you know, maybe we can, where, where it makes sense and, and where, you know, there's a business reason to do it, use the cloud to scale up in some ways, as opposed to, you know, building for peak um, what we have on the studio and, and that can sometimes be cost prohibitive. So um, yeah, th there's definitely some, some of that where we're using uh, technology to, to be more efficient and, and that's pretty exciting. A phrase that I actually made up to try to describe this, I actually been using this made up word for a while. I call it being technative where I think this is now where the application space of where you have to be technically minded and creatively minded where in the past we were able to sort of compartmentalize those and sort of describe, well, you're left brained and I'm right brain and we're different people and never the two should need to meet. And the fact of the matter is now we're all having to be a little bit more technitive in our approach to these things. I think the people that attack it that way tend to be a little more successful or run into fewer speed bumps. Speaking of speed bumps, I think Reed, the funniest thing is you can talk about all of Fox Sports doing all this stuff or Paul talking about all this slack and it comes down to fonts. <laughs> like fonts is the thing that'll like yeah. gum up the gears. I, I, it's like, isn't that totally like, that's exactly what goes wrong. You could, you could wait so for this for a year and never come up with that being a problem you'll need to solve. There's you know? so many things like that. I, I'm sure these two know as well, but yeah. Yeah, it's well, I want to get one of. specifically. One, one uh, quickie I want to slip in here. Romeo asked that they're struggling with audio edits when working with remote computers. I think that's a comment based on like the fidelity or fineness or the resolution of being able to move one frame or hear one frame or the latency of sub 50 milliseconds. Do any of you have experience with that or possibly we can help Romeo out a, a solution that's worked? I mean, I would, I would say, you know, I think that's a problem on video too. I think we, you know, when you talk about cloud editing and whatnot, you often see some sort of a delay or an out of sync issue, whether it be even just a couple of frames where it's not exact. Um, you know, audio for, for us, our audio uh, engineers are pulling everything down and working locally on, on, on local, on, on-prem, meaning in their houses, uh, Pro Tools workstations. So we don't have that issue in terms of that. But yeah, I, I think if you're like VPNing into a machine and you're expecting audio to be like spot on frame by frame, I, I don't think that's going to happen for you. It, yeah, it's I mean, tough. We, we, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Laura. No, no, it's okay. I, uh, I was going to say, yeah, it's definitely um, an issue that I know editors have been having. Um, for us and, and, you know, especially in promo, really wanting beats and frames and everything to be, you know, spot on. Um, it has been a difficulty. I think, you know, some of them have, have come up with workarounds, whether it be exporting a quick time and checking and going back in or kind of uh, like Paul said, if people do have a local system, sometimes they'll, they'll grab the media and do all the fine tuning um, uh, locally so that they, they know that everything's perfect. Yeah, it, it's it's a tough one. Um, we're working on uh, getting better with um, Teradici, which is a sort of high performance VPN system um, to our, our local machines um, and to the cloud. It, it, it's not perfect yet, but in, in some sort of uh, sandbox testing, um, we, we've gotten it pretty close to where you can kind of have a, a much better tactile feel as though the computer is, is right in front of you. Um, there's not too many other options. That's kind of really the only true performance. It, we also have HPs. They have a, a, like an inherent um, application protocol called RGS, which provides that too. But the, the challenge for our facilities, and I'm, I'm sure you know many Windows others. Windows only, though. So that's uh, the, exactly. And I, actually, I think it's HP only. It's HP only. Um, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's not even just Windows only. So um, and and a lot of our systems, we did switch over to PC, which is probably still a. Uh, uh, taboo for, for some people, but um, so, so it, you don't always have that luxury. And, and, and even the challenge for us, uh, we don't have a lot of great, um, I shouldn't say great, but uh, we don't have a ton of people with this expertise. 
to be able to um, support these workflows at scale. Um, and I'm sure that's the case for, for just about anybody, you know, to stand something up, whether it's small or large, you're not going to have a team of people waiting around to stand up, you know, high performance cloud editing workflows. That's <laughs> just, is not where we were before all this started, but, but there are some solutions and I think um, everyone will kind of get a little bit better at deploying them. Here's a question for Laurel. This was from uh, Kristen and Kristen, it's a comment and question about in future employment. I think it's really great. Uh, most editing jobs tend to be centralized in California. I would say California and New York is where most of the edit community for m and &E tends to be. Um, do you foresee post houses and opportunities like that opening up for more diverse persons that are not able or willing to live in a city like Los Angeles? I mean, I, I definitely think uh, that we've kind of done a POC, you know, really prove that that you can work from anywhere. Um, and I, I mean, I would, I do think that it'll evolve uh, to where there's going to be a little bit more variety geographically, which will bring in more talent, which would be fantastic. Um, and I know personally, I would like to have a little bit more flexibility about where I can be uh, geographically. And I, you know, we, we do have some editors that we work with who aren't in California and I could see that expanding as well. And I hope it does. Yeah, you know, the, um, and that's great with the editorial community. I think the editorial community has had probably one of the biggest trials by fire here in terms of a specific sect. Unfortunately, you know, the production community just got put on the sidelines and that, that's like the hardest hit. Um, but in terms of the most anxiety of being able to have to respond to COVID, I think the editorial community is had taken the lion's share. And of course we need talented people like you to sit above that and help make sure and sort of be the conductors of this crazy orchestra that we're all playing in right now. Um, but a question that keeps coming up from several people, Oliver asked it, Matthew asked it. Um, what the question is, is how do you do remote color correction? And I would throw in the remote sound mixing because if you, it, we understand that the colorists and the sound mixers may have local prem, they've got the proper calibration, they're all good to go. How are you handling remote color and remote sound for your projects? Uh, well, as you said, uh, you know, the colorists are working on prem. There's no color, we're not doing any color work by remotely controlling a machine either in the cloud or through a VPN to our office or something like that. Um, everything is downloaded locally and worked on, you know, frame by frame and, and, and all of that. Um, Specifically same. then, Paul, with the review of that. So they've got that taken care of. How are you being able to approve that work? Yeah, I mean, using, using Frame.io and using uh, our, uh, another system that we have called SpotMail that we, we actually created at Showtime. It's a, it's a proprietary system uh, for sharing links. It's not ideal. Uh, clearly, you want to bring somebody into a properly maintained color room and look at it with like color correct paint on the walls and the right lighting and shading and all that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, you're, you're just sort of expressing your idea. By the way, we're dealing with the same thing on the print side, where you've got, you know, billboards going up for brand new campaigns and art directors don't have physical proofs in front of them to look at. And so, you know, number one, it's expensive to start shipping proofs all over the country, depending on where people are. And, and it's also just the time that it takes to do that. And so we're having to trust monitors and calibration of those monitors and things like that. And, you know, trusting our colleagues as well, right? We have people who are experts at that in the production department. And, and to some extent, the creative team on, on video and print have to trust that that colorist is, is hitting the mark in some ways. And, and, th and that's part of what goes back to the efficiency, right? Because if you, if you can't see it then, and you're not weighing in and making changes and, and it's good enough and you're trusting the professionals on your staff that you work with side by side, then you're actually creating efficiency there because you're not going round and round with changes and right, right. making unnecessary uh, revisions and, and, you know, it, it as we all know, these things are all subjective, right? We're not hanging this stuff up in the Museum of Modern Art. It's for commercial purposes and, and it goes by in the blink of an eye. So, you know, I think this has forced us to keep some of that in perspective. And so we've, we've gotten some efficiencies out of that. Uh, I would 100% agree with that. I think um, kind of the notion that what you said of good enough, and that doesn't mean then it's bad, but just kind of realizing that there are some legitimate limitations, especially with color correction. 
And so, you know, it's that notion of everybody, um, everybody doing the best they can and, and really trusting the people who are in those roles. I think, um, I think on a creative side, uh, you know, the review, we're doing color correction review in frame. Um, and it's a variable. Some people are looking on phones, some people are looking on laptops and everybody's kind of working differently. Um, and just trying to to make the best uh, decisions we can. I think, I think from from my perspective, I think color correction in the cloud, or even just the process for color correction when you're not at a facility, is an area where I think I think there's hopefully some innovation to be had there. Yeah, same. We're, we're you know with audio and, and color correction, you the the good news there is you don't need a ton of source footage, right? So you can render something out and, uh, and then work on it on a local machine and, and you don't have to deal with that challenge. But then, you know, not everyone has really high end monitors at their home or wherever they're working. But it's, you know, it is, it is bringing up an interesting question that we're still discussing and I'm not sure where we've landed, but you know, a lot of people are, there, there's kind of a, a new school of thought in which do you really need this high end, you know, CRT or OLED monitor to color correct, you know, at least for our stuff, for, for television and, and, and in sports, especially where it doesn't, it doesn't air a lot, right? It's not, it's not a feature film. Um, and, you know, is it tolerable to perhaps do a, a, some degree of color correction on that, at least for review and approval on a monitor that's, that's comparable to what people have in their homes, right? Um, to some degree that, that provides a, a, a true sense of what people are gonna see in their home. Um, even if it's not perhaps the most scientifically accurate, you know, color representation of, of what you're working on, who really has that, th that type of setup, right? Now, <laughs> again, different for feature films where that's going to be exhibited in, in, a, in, a, in a theater. Um, but, but for some of our stuff, it, like I said, it's, it's just an interesting school of thought that, that we are discussing. And, and I think you're seeing a bit more tolerance to uh, something like that right now. You're absolutely right, Reed. And I think that actually points out another thing. It's a little serendipitous in a way. If we look at all the technology that has come online, let's say over the last five years, um, we're talking about HDR, we're talking about 4K, we're talking about tighter specifications, we're talking about better panel technology like quantum dots and OLED. That gap that you described is continuing to get narrower and narrower. Had this pandemic happened prior to a lot of the digital transmission or high quality streaming solutions on these great TVs that exist now, I, I guarantee the gap would have been much further apart. Even people have sound bars that are, you know, Dolby certified and things like that. Now, is that the same as a speaker in a color or mixing room? Absolutely not, but it's closer than the speakers that are actually built into a monitor or television, which is what we kind of used to use anyway, right? So I think it's sort of serendipitous that early adopters, I'm an early adopter, so I'm also like um, kind of like a, a sucker for the new stuff as it comes out. But now I'm finding that my experience with that new stuff is helpful to people to understand that they've end up asking me, what should I buy? What should I use? And a lot of them already have it. And the stuff that's coming through the TV looks really good. Uh, I would say better than it's ever looked because we've all sort of narrowed our specifications or possibly improved them. Every group, and maybe we talk a moment about that. We'll start with you, Paul. Uh, what, has your group um, essentially, what has changed in your specifications, let's say over the last five years for delivery that is actually working out better given the situation we're in? Hmm, that's a good question. Um... What has changed? I mean, I, I think, you know, there's a, there's a much greater tolerance to sort of YouTube generation for like quality of video isn't of the highest standard anymore. I think people are used to watching stuff that has a little bit of a compressed look to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so doing things like, uh, you know, cutting in Adobe Premiere on like a ProRes 422 Kodak or something like that is, is much more acceptable today than it was five or 10 years ago, right? Like everybody, you had to have the, you know, the, the most uh, quality. And, and I think people have come to realize that that's not the case. I mean, look at some of the programming that's on TV right now, these in-home uh, productions on, uh, on all of our broadcast networks, uh, CBS, NBC and whatnot, these sort of like live shows, the late night shows, they're all shooting on like iPhones and, uh -huh. you know, like you're right. They're shooting on something that fits in your pocket. 
and um, and and it's okay. I mean, everybody's okay with it, and it doesn't look so bad anymore. So the jokes are still funny, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny because we've actually found ourselves at times even before all of this, where we, you know, somebody as a third camera had an iPhone going at like a Homeland shoot, and we wound up using a lot of the footage off of that camera because they happen to be in an advantageous position and caught a couple of cool moments and you would have thought like, you know, you, you know, you, you'd be hung from a cross if that happened five years ago. But, you know, obviously now it's like, yeah, that looks great. No problem. You know? Um, and we do a lot more stuff uh, that a lot more creative things nowadays that stem out of our social media group, for example, where they might send out some of these lower end cameras or like iPhone like devices, have the cast do something themselves like a selfie riding a bicycle and, Next thing you know, that's turned into an on-air promo or even a piece of a trailer or something like that. And, you know, and it's perfectly acceptable. So I would just, that's all I can really think of at the moment for, to answer that question. It's just the, the acceptability of some of these lower tier devices and more affordable devices. Laurel and Reed, following up with that, Laurel, in terms of higher quality, has anything changed in your network in the last five years about the specs uh, in terms of what you distribute that now becomes an advantage or maybe a disadvantage in COVID situation? Um, you know, in terms of specifics on, on delivery, you know, I wish I knew more specifics on what we're doing, but I think, um, you know, on a promo side, I, I, for me, it's speaking kind of to what, what Paul just said about the tolerance of, of the quality of what the content is. And I think it's the focus of, that content is some in, in many ways more important right now than actually how it was shot. Um, and being a little bit more patient, like the, the idea of having something new on the air is much more exciting than not having anything at all. So if it's shot via Zoom, like we've done before for some promos, or shot on, on personal iPhones, that's fine, because people are just excited to see things. And so I think it's it's prioritizing content over technical in some ways, which I don't think we ever would have thought of, because we're, you know, I think as a community, sometimes we tend to be snobby about how things are shot and don't want things to be pro, you know, consumer or whatever it is. So I think it's, it's um, shifting that balance a little bit. I uh, know that's, that's well said. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's, it is more uh, a content based focus. Um, and, you know, it was interesting where we were seeing, you know, we're always trying to push the envelope on technology for in many cases, quality, right? Like HDR has kind of been the latest thing that, that at least for us, we're, we're, um, getting more competent with and, ex and experimenting more with and, and that's you know more or less been put on hold right <laughs> like just to figure out look at anything that you can get your hands on that looks halfway decent let's 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 get that and then you know we'll come back to um, you know increasing the quality with things like HDR or, or you know UHD formats um, but yeah it, it, it's I think Laurel said it well it's it's whatever's new and, and now <laughs> and that's kind of to some degree always going kind to of Fox Sports's mantra is we're always looking for lating, latest and greatest up-to-date stuff and, and we've seen that tolerance I think start to um, change a lot you know in, in the last few years leading up to this anyway with a lot of news-based shows and YouTube clips and I think you know a lot of people are already getting their content from um, social media content and, and you know look at TikTok because it's vertical videos becoming the new standard uh, even though I you know much to my chagrin, but you know, I think those sorts of things are changing the landscape. Yeah, and you, yeah, when you're talking about the word like uh, landscape and, and yes, the, the, the portrait orientation sort of taking over, these are new trends and tolerance is changing. What's interesting is, uh, you know, we, we actually uh, work on the frame I always used on the Conan O'Brien show and sort of the joke I was making, Paul, is that jokes are funny no matter if, what camera they're shot on. If they're good jokes, people are gonna laugh, right? So we have some of the community that can, can leverage those technologies. Saturday Night Live is another one using that and so on. Uh, and then there's other technologies that are requiring uh, higher end performance because they're not going to be live or they're, they're supposed to be a theatrical release sometime in the future. And they gotta be considerate of those issues now. Uh, so it, it actually reminded me of something. Um, last weekend was the One World concert that I think like 25 million people watch. That was all done with Frame.io. Frame.io was the core foundation for that entire system and all those artists and shared. They had something like 6,500 independent assets generated for that show. And that show was started on Frame.io and then it was streamed in 14 days. And they created 6,500 unique assets and shared some 
hundreds and hundreds of links of review for that. And they did it in two weeks. Um, and so it's a, it's a good example where that was really just, if you think about it, that whole show was powered by Apple in a way, because this was the technology everybody had. That's a story I'd like someone to kind of dig into. It's like how Apple has essentially become the ubiquitous device that's connecting so many people together for the actual creative content itself, which is sort of a different subject. But um, one, one of the questions that, that came up here, there was a question from Christian and Kyle that was asking about how to actually do high end color correction for remote review and calibrated color correction. And I just want to tease that next Tuesday, we'll be releasing an episode of Frame.io series work from home, workflow from home that deals with that. We're going to actually show a 3000 mile remote color correction session that's done with software only because uh, some people really only have a software, so they can only deal with the software solution. I think Paul, you mentioned people are reticent to have people deliver stuff to their home. There's issues with that. Uh, not everybody is in the place that they need to be to physically get interaction. So uh, that's something we'll talk about, but I wanna use that to sort of kind of round the bases here as we kind of come back. How are you all specifically using Frame.io? Can you give an example of how it actually has helped your groups uh, in this time of remote work? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously in the traditional way, if the way that, that most people think about Frame.io is sharing links for review and, and getting comments back on that video. And that's, um, you know, that, that, that's the expected way. And, and clearly we're using it in that, in that way. Um, but, you know, we've also found other ways of utilizing it because it is in the cloud and, it, and it's this sort of centralized point that people can get to, uh, that we can manage the, the permissions to certain assets and things like that. And so we really expanded the use of it to be more about kind of asset distribution and um, uh, in some ways as sort of a screening platform for people that need to get access just, just to watch stuff. Maybe they're a marketing strategy person and they need access to a piece of content. We can control those permissions uh, we, and, and do, some, do some cool things with like password protecting it and, and uh, making private or public links and stuff like that, right? Um, also for cre uh, the creative teams to collaborate, you know, the, the office isn't there anymore. There's no conference rooms to huddle in and hang stuff up on the walls, uh, at the start of a new campaign for one of our new shows or something that we've got premiering. And so frame became a great place to do that, to, to create a bunch of projects for the print and the video and the digital teams and the social teams to all kind of collaborate over assets that they can sort of dump in and share and comment on and communicate around those things um, bef long before there are any finished assets or things that are out for review. It's just about like the old school tear, things you, you'd rip stuff out of magazines or you'd copy a link of a video off a, of a website. And so now you can dump it all into these little projects that we've created and a creative director can sort of manage the audience of people that it allows to see those elements. So we're finding like really interesting ways of, of utilizing it in that, in that sense that we didn't expect. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I wish I could come up with an additional thing, but uh, what, what Paul said, because that's pretty much how we're all, we're using it. I, I would say overall, um, we've been able to kind of not force, but really encourage people to use all the great traditional frame features that maybe they hadn't done before. They were still living in email and presentation links. And I think once people don't have that moment to, or that ability to go into someone's bay and really have that interaction, the wonderful features of frame of being able to give frame accurate comments and draw and all of that, um, I think people are really seeing how valuable that is. Uh, for many uh, in our department. And I also think I've kind of, you know, I use it to make notes on episodes and source material to get to editors and really give detailed things. But I also was kind of thinking of it kind of like a, not Pinterest, but that sort of thing. If, if there's a new project, I can throw a bunch of images that I've grabbed from the internet or inspiration and kind of have a virtual whiteboard or a virtual like, you know, inspiration board that I found um, I'm now doing in Frame.io that I didn't before. Yeah, we have uh, one kind of cool initiative. Um, you know, historically, we're, we're using, we're not doing a lot of very formal review and approval processes. It's, it's a lot of sort of, you know, aggregate some shots, take a look, what do you think, and, you know, get it to the editor pretty quickly, and in some cases using it for, for delivery for some, from different locations. Um, but one uh, project that was kind of coming up 
um, at the right time here, and, and we've been able to even dive into it more, we, we, we're getting a lot of our creative production uh, and specifically like feature producers together um, in, in a sort of, you know, a little process, I want to say a room, but it's not, <laughs> it was going to be a room, um, and, and sharing some of their work that they've done and then and collaborating and, and giving feedback to one another where, you know, typically they're, they're laser focused on, you know, their next project. And, and so now we even have a little bit more time to step back on that. So they're using Frame.io to essentially submit some of their work and then give each other feedback on that work directly and, and using, you know, frame-based comments and um, in some cases, you know, some of the markup and, and then, um, and then sharing those and, you know, picking a few out, there's kind of a, a lead uh, feature producer uh, selecting a few and then, and then getting everybody together on, on a Zoom call like this to talk about talking about them. But, and Frame.io is the background for this. And exactly as Laurel said, they're, they're using it in, in ways that you know, they either hadn't spent the time to figure out or, or, you know, when you're sitting next to the editor, you, you don't have a need for. And, and so it's been exciting to kind of see some of those those features that I've been pointing to, like, look at this, you can draw on that and say, you know, correct this. And nobody seems to, to care in some cases when they're, when they're, you know, focused on getting something done. But, but now you're seeing some of those uh, come to life. It, it's been cool. Yeah. Well, before we go, I want to do one more question, go around one more time. I think it's important, you know, given the climate, given everything that's happening, I think it's really important to end on a high note. So I just like to hear from everyone very briefly, give us something positive with, uh, what is happening because of this so that we have something positive to share with uh, the viewers today? There's nothing positive from this. Oh, <laughs> just kidding. I kid, I kid. Uh, something positive. Um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, I mean, we, we started with the human element. So maybe I'll start there in, in, in this, in that, you know, we're doing like um, team happy hours. So 4.30 on a Friday, by the way, anybody on the call can join. I'll send the link out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, we're, we're doing like a, a Zoom kind of happy hour. Everybody grab a drink of your choice, right? The chips, get your kids, get your dogs. And like, we're all, all my production technology organization is on there, or at least those that aren't like pressed on a deadline. Um, and, and, you know, just seeing everybody um, you, you can see it in everybody's faces. I mean, and, and I'm, me included, I, I'm enjoying a lot of the aspects of being at home, not commuting, not feeling like I'm being pulled in 900 different directions. I can kind of control that a little bit more and it can be just about the work when I want to work. And, and, um, you know, the days are a little bit longer, but you don't have those commute and those kinds of things. So there's a lot of like human element positives. I, I think we covered some of the, the, the technology has really allowed for efficiency. It's allowed this opportunity has allowed us to discover ways that we were inefficient before that we can now be more efficient. Um, you know, we're even collaborating with a lot of our vendors out there in the world because we're all going to at some point get back to physical production. And so, uh, you know, literally being on a set or shooting stuff with cameras in front of people, and we've got to contend with that. And we've got this interim period where we've got to figure out how do we build something that we can ship into someone's home, like one of our stars or cast members, that they can plug in themselves and it can be really simple to operate. And so we've partnered with a couple of our really trusted vendors that we use on East Coast and West Coast to help us uh, sort of realize that vision for some of the upcoming things we want to do. And we're also talking to them about what is the future look like because when we go on set and we're allowed back to work even after there's a vaccine by the way i think it's all going to be very different right like you're not going to have craft services the way you used to have it where it was a community table of food and you've got you know bathroom doors aren't going to have handles on them anymore they're going to be swinging doors there's you know there's going to be all kinds of weird stuff that we're not even thinking about that are going to change the way we're able to actually do live production and shoot actors and those actors aren't gonna be comfortable with a room full of people anymore behind the camera. They're gonna want really small closed sets and we're gonna to have to deal with that. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, I think the relationship part of it, we're, we're, like I said, meeting with a lot of our vendors and a lot of our employees and a lot of our team members to collaborate on how we achieve all of this stuff and how the world is gonna change, right? I, I guess ultimately it's that. It's probably more teamwork, I think I would say, in general would be the positive for me. Um, yeah, I think, you know, really the, the human aspect is where I've found probably the most positives. Um, I think, you know, coming together as a team, troubleshooting as a team, helping each other out, those things have all been really big. Uh, I also think, you know, just kind of changing 
changing what's acceptable at work. You know, if a kid comes in on a Zoom and it's, you know, it's fine or the, do the those sorts of things where I think we're letting down our guard again a, a little bit and and just being a little less rigid about how we, we go through our day to day. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that I've noticed, you know, especially with a lot of the guys doing our, in our operations and, and, and those of us thinking of technology ideas is that we're willing to take more risks, whereas maybe something we would have wanted to spend like six months fully testing it and it has to be perfect. Now it's like, well, we'll give it a go. We'll see what happens. Maybe it'll be great. And so I think, um, I think that's a, a really interesting positive from all of this. Yeah, that's a great one, Laurel. Um, you know, I think it's, it's all that cool technical stuff that we get to, to try a little bit and, um, you know, taking a step back and, and seeing, you know, it's certainly, I think this has changed everybody's perspective. Right. And, and, uh, you know, you, you're, I think collectively we're going to let a lot of things go that might used to bother us, whether we're talking about a technical hurdle or, 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 or you know, anything else in, in our daily lives, right? That, that's certainly a positive. And, you know, I think on, on a personal note, I, you know, I, was, I used to joke sometimes about what, what skill I would have if the apocalypse comes and not that we're in it, but uh, it, it certainly it feels like it a little bit, right? And I, my joke is that I, I got nothing. This is I have no use to provide society, you know, outside of the uh, media business. But but the good news for me is I, it's we've been deemed essential. So uh, truly, I think to some degree, people need you know what we all do, right? Creating content for people to kind of uh, escape from whatever it is, or or really enjoy you know the work that people are doing. So um, the fact that we're we are contributing something here that that impacts people positively is, is uh, something uh, that I do appreciate. And that is not to be understated. That's absolutely what we do for a living and we do bring to our communities. And it's, it's extremely important. And to put a cap on that, I would say that I, I echo everything that you all said. And I, I want to point out what Laurel said as well in that I find that historically our industry tends to be a risk adverse industry when it comes to technological progression. We are conservative mostly for good reason, because if we overextend ourselves or trip up, dates are messed up or missed with airing and certain deliveries. So there's reason to be hesitant, but that hesitancy can actually have a dark side, which is actually preventing progress. And I think that we have um, a lot of habits that are old habits that many of us shake, our present company excluded, but there's a lot of habits people have are like, oh, we're still you know, doing that, right? And so the idea is that I think the biggest positive coming out of this is taking some of the people that usually fall in the skeptics category and moving them up towards the early adoption category. And then if they come out on top of that and realize that it's not so bad and we were successful, maybe it will help people be a little less skeptical going forward and, and, and use that pragmatistic approach, which is a safe way to go forward, but not to be dismissive of something that, oh, that'll never work. That's the stuff that I always feel will actually hurt us as a progressive industry and then other industries can catch up to us. Sometimes you look at Hollywood, it's not actually the leader of some of the tech in the world. We're a follower and we should be a leader. If we're the leader of entertainment and we are so based in technology and creativity, we should be a leader in that space as well. And I think this is a great discussion we had today that has some really positive outlooks. So I wanna thank you all for joining us, Paul from Showtime, Laurel from CBS and Reed from Fox Sports. Thank you so much for your expertise and time today. We greatly appreciate it. And congratulations to the success of you and your teams and continue to stay healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm assuming we're safe, so thanks.